Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new podcast. We're going to call this Insecurity. So if you have a better name, leave it in the show notes. But we want to talk about security. So I have with me my most favorite security person in Tom Webster. How are you, Tom? Doing pretty well. So what are we doing here? Um, you know, I have no idea. I have, I have no idea why we even attempted this. Um, the long and the short of it is people need a short, condensed, what's the security news of the week sort of podcast, um, talking back and forth about stuff, making it easy for the average Joe to jump into it. Um, other security podcasts can be a little heavy-handed, a little technical. We're going to try to stay on the lighter side of things, but might devolve. Well, I, I like the idea. You came to me and you said, and you said, "Hey, maybe we can do something." And I like the idea of taking, taking some big topic. Let's say every Thursday's Guardian article, and let's bear it down into what it really means to the people and how we can go to either stop it or to continue with it or what should we do to be safe and when there is no Guardian article we'll take something else and we'll discuss it and the goal is something for your mother to listen to on her way to work <laughs> hmm. if I could accomplish that goal I think we would have made it we would be more secure the world <laughs> would be more secure if all our mothers listened to insecurity on their way to work this this could work out that's a good goal to shoot for so what do you want to talk about today? Today, um, let's go over, and really it's not hugely surprising. Um, the, uh, the Guardian came out, Greenwald came out and said, hey everyone, listen, the NSA is tapping into your address books and they are getting metadata. And of course, the, uh, the kind of non-story around it was the NSA said, oh no, it's just, it's just metadata, we're just, you know, we're not reading your emails, we're just figuring out the connections. And luckily, the, the tech community and the, the journalism community at large has said, hey, no, that's not quite right. The metadata is actually the biggest component of this. It's actually the thing that tells you the most about a person. Um, there was a, uh, I believe I was listening to NPR this morning, and someone was talking about it. They said, hey, look, it, just by looking at my metadata, just by looking at who I'm calling or who I'm emailing, you can tell if I'm going for a competing job offer, if I'm seeing a psychiatrist, if I'm having an affair. And, you know, the third one you might say, oh, well, you should get busted having an affair. But the first two, I don't really want my company knowing that, you know, I'm out shopping around for better jobs. It doesn't really do anything good for my career at the present day. And if you're going to see a psychiatrist, that's, that's privileged information. If you're talking to a lawyer, that's also privileged information. No one should know that. So it's... It's kind of a big deal, and at the same time, we kind of already knew this was happening. Well, I mean, when I heard about it the first time, I initially shrugged it off as, oh, it's metadata, like, who really cares? And I, like you said, you thought about it. It's not the content. I mean, if I'm, if you're right, if I'm talking to a competing job company, it doesn't matter what the email says. It just says that I'm talking to somebody. We clearly got the idea, whether it's accepting a job offer, denying a job offer, anything like that. And, and you start to wonder... Who's not who's allowing this, but why aren't more people like really angry about all of this? And I just think it's because they take it like how we took it before, or I took it before. Who really cares? The contents of the email, that's the important part. But they, they, they don't seem to think that way. Um, one other thing that, uh, that came up that I forgot to put in our show notes, um, kind of a huge, huge story, which was awesome is that uh, it's finally come to light that, because, you know, um, in the big congressional hearings, we heard, oh, no, no, these, these uh, surveillance programs have stopped 54 terrorist plots. Th I did number, hear that. Right? Good number. I heard that. Everyone heard that. They were just like, yeah, okay, I still don't agree with it. I still think it's wrong. I still think you're doing us a great injustice. Thank God it's not completely worthless. You should stop, right? Because, I mean, come on. More people die in airplane crashes per capita than terrorist attacks. It's Well, look, if it actually stopped a large amount of terrorist attacks, then then may maybe, maybe, maybe we can talk. But right. maybe. 
I'm not saying let's have at, a conversation. Let's, at let's the put very the least, at the very least, it offers a talking point. Let's let's use that metadata to figure out what our conversation is if we're going from there. Right. But but you're you're focusing you're re, you're reducing all our privacy, all our security to zero just because because yeah, terrorism is sad when it happens when it happens and it hits home. It's sad compared to a car accident, which we kind of pass off as a normal way of life. And and that's the problem. And going back to you're stealing address books. I heard buddy list, and my first reaction was, when was the last time I used a buddy list? <laughs> if you want on my AOL screen name. Maybe I'll give that up. But but yeah, they're going through our address books and somebody did the math. They said that they can uh, they're gonna go three degrees of separation on a thousand people. If you have a thousand people and they do three degrees of separation, that's a billion people. Yeah. And that's a, that's more than the number of Americans that that they're not spying on, right? Right. So I I mean you you look at these numbers that they're touting and you know, on one hand, it's it's a big measuring contest, right? It's oh no, we can we can surveil this many people, but we're not spying on you, really. No, no, you you're protected. No, you're you're good, dog. Don't worry. Um, for you know, fifty four terrorist plots foiled, and actually, it uh, it was awesome. It came out that they said, well, it wasn't really fifty four. It was more like one or two. Yeah, definitely more like one or two. Maybe one, could be two, definitely one or two. Though. But we had yeah. the workings. We had some details ahead of time. Yes, yes. Well, you see, what, what we're doing is we're making fun of them stopping. We shouldn't make fun of them stopping. We should focus on what they're doing all of this and for what. They're, they're, they're accessing, they're tapping us upstream, they're, they're stealing our metadata, they're doing all this, and they're saying it's for terrorism, but w what are they trying to do? And, and now they're taking our address books? Like, it's, so now, if we, in the future, commit a crime, it, this is pre-crime from uh, the Tom Cruise movie. Yeah. It's That's what they're doing. Report. From, yeah. So, they're taking, now, what's the significance of, I mean, what's the real significance of taking the address books? I mean, let let's let's break it down. I guess. I mean, w so, what are we doing so, with that? So I think the biggest significance for any normal person is no matter what your method of communication is, no speech, and at all, no speech is under special protection. Uh, you could. So no one really thought that you know. Okay, I my grandmother calls me every year on my birthday. So what? Yeah, the NSA can listen into that, but do you really want the NSA, or especially if you're going for a job with any of the government agencies, do you really want them knowing your psychiatric background? Maybe you're talking to a lawyer about something that was potentially illegal that you did that you might get sued for. Do you really want that coming out? And, and I think the, the biggest question in everyone's mind is, how much money are we dumping into this black budget to vacuum up all this data, to vacuum up all these address books, to fool one or two terrorist plots across the lifetime of these programs? I mean, let's let's use the old politician argument. How much does this cost? And what does it really get us? Well, it doesn't matter how much it costs, because as I say at my job, money is absolutely no object. It doesn't matter, because when it comes to personal <laughs> safety, we can hire people for minimum wage with bl uh, blue uniforms standing at the airport and protecting us. <laughs> protecting well, us. Yeah. Well, so did they say, was it email address books or is it your phone, your SIM address books? Um, email know? address books. Okay. So, so couldn't that, I mean, let, let's play a little bit of devil's advocate. Don't we give that when we use Google Plus or Facebook or Twitter? Don't we give that up anyway? I don't think, I mean... I think if they had Facebook, they would have a lot more people of mine than stealing my internet address book. Right, right, and they would. But it's it comes down to the old adage of, just as Steve Gibson always says, I have no problem sharing with people that I trust. And I guess that's the point. So I don't really trust Facebook, but to get to get the, the application working and to talk to people who I need to talk to, I give up that little bit of, okay, I'll let you be my friend in order to communicate. And and it seems to work. Facebook hasn't really violated my trust yet that I know of. But <laughs> we but 
I mean, but then now you're going into my phone address book. And here's a better point. I don't think anybody knows anybody else's number anymore. That's true. That's very true. I don't, I mean, I know my own phone number, but that's it, really. I probably know five phone numbers. My house, mine, my wife, and my parents' phone number, and my dad, because it used to be my cell phone number. But that's about it. And and so now we have a problem because clearly the way to stop this is just to get rid of all the names and just have the phone numbers. Right? Uh, sort of. Yeah, sort of. Um... Because the metadata would say the account holder. Uh, like, I think if somebody calls me, it's... Let's say my wife calls me. I think it just says Verizon Wireless. So they would have to go to Verizon, which is not hard, and figure out who it's associated with. That's well, one more step. That's assuming they don't already have that. Yeah, I mean, they don't. Yeah, re remember that Verizon and AT&T were caught more or less a couple mm -hmm. years ago installing all kinds of black boxes on their property and basically handing over anything to the feds that they wanted. So our burner phones, so now we can't store anyone's name in the contact book. We can't obviously give them a different moniker because that's just uh, that's just doing nothing. It's it's shining. It's putting lipstick on a pig, I guess. Right. Uh, I guess we have to do the burner phones, but then I read something that the NSA has an issue with that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's going to affect, but um, there was rumored that, or maybe it has become a law already, that you have to identify yourself while purchasing a burner phone. It will not be activated unless you can give a traceable ID. Uh, okay. So I, I think what we have to do is we have to go straight up XMPP. We've got to go right through Jitsi. We've got to go through a bunch of open source shit with a bunch of encryption protocols because email is unsafe. Phone calls are very unsafe. Um, I mean, there's, there's not a lot of ways to send semi-anonymous messages anymore. Everything is way too traceable. And PGP well, makes it better, but the metadata is still there, right? What about what about a letter? I mean, I thought that was one of the rules. They can't touch the letters. They, they shouldn't be able to touch the letters, but... I, I mean, mean, they shouldn't knows? have been able to touch our phone calls, right? Well, but I think that the... Remember, who runs... The federal government runs the mail, and if I touch... <laughs> God forbid I touch my wife's mail, and it, like, falls out, and I have to clean up all those Valpac coupons. I mean, I can be thrown in jail for that, right? <laughs> yes. Now, remember... Um, so I, I did some sleuthing around way back in the day on the Silk Road forums, um, and no one... Uh, on recommended shipping actions, no one said, oh, yeah, go UPS or go FedEx. It was always, you have to send USPS no matter what because they require a warrant to open a package. If that's still the case, sending a letter is probably your best bet. So all our communications from now on will be snail mail. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. We're going to go back to the 1920s with this one. Well, what about the old uh, Nextel technology? I guess that was just impl that was just in that was just radio waves, right? We yeah, couldn't do it, was, the, the it was analog cell. Um, I mean, if you can get those to work, but that's it's analog traffic. It's easily picked up and shift. So, so there's no. So we're going back. We go full circle. There's no effective, secret way to communicate unless we're using one-time pads and. If you can do. Um, so if you can do a, a key-like system or like a Diffie-Hellman type system um, over ham radio, you might be able to get encrypted traffic past the NSA. Uh, I mean, they'd still intercept it, but they may not know what you're saying or to who. Maybe we need to look. Maybe the ham radio is the way to go because who would think to to, to scout the ham radio callers? We I mean, all they're doing a terrorist group full of ham operators. Uh, they're the ones supposedly saving our lives. <laughs> I mean, they're, a lot of them are, are cranky old dudes anyway. I mean, why not? I'm just well, kidding. Ham operators, that... I love you. No, well, a lot of people I know are ham operators. But the funny part is, is they've been complaining, and rightfully so, that their frequency has been taken away. Mm -hmm. So we just so every year they take more and more frequency and, and we say but that's our four G's we need our four G's you know what I don't think anybody's looking there they're probably finally saying you know what they're gonna be old 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 guys talking you know what who cares what they say maybe just I'm, in plain sight I'm maybe you can go hold up signs. <laughs>
That's a good one. So we're halfway through, and let's. So the next one was Greenwald says the worst is yet to come. Yeah. Do, do are we going to speculate or do we do we have an idea? Honestly, I think it's going to be. Um, if I had to guess, it's going to be a complete erosion of the criminal justice system and everything is uh, everything is shared with all kinds of law enforcement. We already know the NSA corroborates with the DEA, but I was just like, yeah, uh, drug dealers, whatever, throw them in jail, no one cares. I want to know how that went down, because what we do know about the NSA is how did somebody convince the NSA to say, you know what, we would like to share, can we share your data? Like, what would they have to give up? They have an unlimited budget, they do whatever they want. What could they possibly want from the DEA? Right, well, what, what do they want from Israel? Well, that was the next question, and I feel embarrassed not knowing the answer. I want to bring in Israel, somebody in the IDF to explain to us how they do security, because I've been to Israel. I lived in Israel. You don't you don't worry about all this stuff. They're doing something right, or it's so bad that we just don't see it. <laughs> it, it could all be security theater for all anyone knows. Well, um, I mean, you want to talk about stopping terrorism. I mean, if you wanted to go to a proven track record, they have stopped terrorism. Not completely, well, but they've worked on it. It's different how they do security over there. So over here, you know, we pay guys minimum wage. You know, just maybe a little bit above a fry cook at McDonald's to kind of pat your groin and send you off on your way to the plane. But they've got guys who will just sit there and give you a death stare. And if you twitch a little bit, they bring you out and say, no, no, no. You're going to sit with me for an hour, and then we might let you go. But they'll, they'll like, give you a stare down. It's a weird approach. Well, they don't ask security. you the three questions. They don't ask you the three questions. What they ask is, what's your name? So I say, my name's Kaim. They clearly know I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. So when I fly LL, they, they, so the next question is something real, like, how many, how many days of Hanukkah are there? And they're <laughs> hoping that you say eight, and you say eight, and that's their cue to say, you know what? This guy's not lying. Let's move on. <laughs> He's not scared. You're like, what are you bothering me with this stupid question? And they've been asked. They've been asked like, they've asked, uh, uh, what do you, put, what do Jews put on their uh, bagels and cream cheese? And the answer being locks, only because that's because all these stereotypical things. But they, they I don't want to say they racially profile, but they absolutely profile. And and look, it seemed to work at least on the planes for them. Yeah, well, well, let's be honest. It's a very small per capita compared to the U.S., right? Of course. It, Israel's got a very small amount of planes going in and out there. And that said, it's a way more volatile area than we have in the States. Way more. But, so, well, we, we, that's, that's another topic we need to worry about. No, mm -hmm. I have no idea what the worst is yet to come means. I mean, I, I, I am walking around with my blinders, and I, I know... Look, Steve Gibson has been right the entire time where he's saying they're just tapping upstream and going from there. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe maybe it's a WikiLeaks type thing where where Snowden has something on one of the three-letter agencies that will take them down, that the feds were using stolen information to prosecute terrorists. I don't know. Maybe something like that, but who knows? I, I would like to see uh, an enemy of the state move where somebody was using inside information to climb political office or take out opposition. It's it, look at this point, nothing is shocking. Yeah, but but let me let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a personal question. If it came out that some high level gov government official or a lot of them, right? Let's say the president and every single congressman. Republicans, Democrats, whatever, everyone has cheated their way into power by threatening people by using the NSA's information, by blackmailing them. Would that be enough to get us to riot? Would that be enough? Would you riot in the streets? Look, I'm already rioting in the streets. That, that's a different. <laughs> so asking me if that's a problem, it's the answer is already yes. It hasn't affected people yet. That that's the problem. Mm -hmm. It's like. That we've given up so much privacy that we really don't care. That I mean, asking us to show our IDs at work, all this, and we say, oh, it's it's for our safety. It it hasn't stopped yet. Me, I don't know what it would take to get something going. I mean, we do. Everyone apparently, the approval rating of Congress is so low that maybe Five something percent? like that will do it. <laughs> it's a little higher, but I think more <laughs> people like Al Qaeda than Congress or something like that. John Stewart did his bit there, but nice. it was 
Yeah, there was something like that. It's like w this really disgusting, really vile thing or Congress, and this the vile thing would get more approval than Congress. <laughs> but may if that came out, maybe that's just another thing to say, what are you doing with all this money? How This is, you're using this information, and we already hate you. Maybe we'll have to re recall some people. I don't know. I don't know what it would take yet. I, I think, uh, honestly, and I, I hate to do this, and I hate to sell out my fellow countrymen, and that's a lie because I love selling out my fellow countrymen, um, but I think what it would take is somebody canceling The Voice and Dancing with the Stars. If the NSA came out and they canceled Dancing with the Stars, people would fucking riot. You're right. Maybe, yeah, maybe we have... Maybe Anonymous takes over the show and starts reading people's name and social security number. I mean... Maybe that's the next kind step. Of paper ready. So, let me go from there. I don't know. So, anything else on these two stories? I mean, the worst is yet to come is so out there yeah. that we can't break it down. But you want to go with the last topic that we have? Yeah, let's go ahead and bring up the last one. Oh. Um, well, well, you go ahead. So, uh, last week I did a security talk called Making Security Shiny. And it wasn't a big thing. It was at a, a small meeting of security people at uh, Ohio InfoSec Forum. Um, great bunch of guys. If you're in the Dayton area, want to get some security on, it's a free thing. Come second Thursday of the month, about 6 o'clock, we've got free food. Awesome. Um, Is that right after Microsoft patches, the second Thursday of the month? No, no, that's, that's uh, the second Tuesday of the month. Well, I know, but you got to give it a day or two. And Do we discuss uh, security <laughs> patches? Yeah. Okay. Um, we actually we haven't brought up security patches in a while, except for saying yes, do your security patches. Um, but it's everything from you know hacking Wi-Fi to uh, breaking perimeter security with uh, actual radios, like guard radios, which was an awesome, awesome talk. Um, but I decided to give a presentation on um, UI and interface design for security applications called making security shiny, um, and I. Totally don't have my website up because I'm a terrible, terrible co-host. So let me do this. And boom, my website down here. You can go there to grab the talk. Um, it's uh, It basically centered around um, pointing out different security applications, how they lay things out, how they're absolutely terrible. Um, and the worst offender being PGP or GPG of all of them because have you used GPG? It's Apparently a train not. wreck. Well, nobody has. That's that's the problem. Right. If, if you could make an encrypted email program look something like Dropbox, it'd be perfect. If you could make it look like Notepad or Paint, it'd be great. We need a one-button action. We need a call to action that says encrypt right yes. here and with a back end that, like you said, there's a wizard. And I, I, I looked through the slides, so I didn't hear Tom's talk, but I went through the slides and I said he's absolutely right. To explain, just to explain even two-factor authentication to somebody, which which is very close to almost being mediocre, <laughs> It is still very painful and how to set it up and when to use it and application specific passwords to the point that people just give up and they say you know what I, I, I relinquish my rights I get it I'm on the internet I'm the product and we move on yeah it's um, one of the examples and probably one of the strongest examples in that talk um, uh, and it looks like we lost him um, give me just a second we're going to try to get him back <laughs> He's coming back online now. Don't you worry. We'll be right here. Um, anyway, the uh, the security talk. Um, we I, I did a whole lot of talking on TrueCrypt, on PGP. Um, there was some talking on LastPass, um, which, by the way, has got one of the awesome, awesome, uh, most awesome interfaces I've seen in a while. Um, except when you get in the settings, 
And uh, I think we've got him back. Hang on. Almost. Almost. It's a pilot episode. You have to excuse this. Almost got it. There we go. Okay. I filled some space. Uh, oh, I, I dropped or you dropped? You dropped. Okay. So, good. I think YouTube still holds it. Okay. Yep. Um, so, what was I? Oh, yeah. So, um, the interfaces. I talked a lot about uh, TrueCrypt, which has major, major issues with way too many buttons. It looks like a big engineer's control panel. Oh, yeah. Uh, Last pa I mean, even LastPass, and I saw that LastPass is another good example. People want Shiny, and they, they want it nice. Like, one password works, but only on a Mac. And I know they have a Windows equivalent, but it doesn't work on mobile, but it does, and you got to pay for it. And as soon as you have to start paying for something, and you don't know the encryption behind it, you kind of give up. Right. And honestly, LastPass was one of the best interfaces in that deck. It's when you get into the settings... And there's, there's a switch, there's a, a, a text field that lets people hurt themselves if they type the wrong thing in. And that's not okay. And it's not like a delete this account button or anything. It's if you set this, value, this arbitrary value with this weird acronym too low, your account will be brute forced. It's very bad. Well, it was scary. I mean, it, and what I liked, and I don't know if you remember this, is when they finally implemented that feature, they started everyone at zero instead of the recommended yeah. 5,000. And I was like, why don't you just put it at 5,000 if that's what you're recommending? Exactly. And I, uh, I, I actually went into that into my talk where I went into my settings, and I think I had set it manually to 1,000 back when that's when they were what they were recommending, and they quickly jumped it up after... Uh, People started using GPUs to crack hashes. And I said, I went into my settings, I was just like, you're recommending this number and I still have this one? Why? It doesn't hurt me at all that you would change this. But... Well, maybe if you're doing it on old 386, I don't know. Uh, I... Um, maybe you're on a Chromebook and, and the processor, or you're on your phone, or you know, you're using I... a Nexus One. I've, I've pulled this up on Windows 2K Pentium 2 machines before. LastPass is a beast. I mean, it works somehow. Um, but, I mean, even even the best of interfaces or even the most, what you would think are the most simple of programs, such as, like, Eraser. Um, Eraser is a program that lets you securely erase files. Um, you open it up, it's got this big, long task scheduler interface, and you have to create tasks and... It, to erase one file, you, you create a one-time task and add to the list and then have to hit play on each individual item. Why? Give me a flaming trash bag that I drag stuff into and get rid of it. Well, maybe we can't all be like Derek's boot, boot and nuke, where it has a we funny name. We and should. it just has one jo job to, to destroy all contents 37 times. Type auto nuke, be done. So... Anyway, anything else before we wrap it up? I think that's it. Okay, we'll end a little early, but you know what? We have the t uh, we always have show technical uh, we always have uh, technical difficulties. What's new? But anyway, <laughs> let us know what you think about this. Uh, we have a Google Plus page. It's in security. You can find it through either one of us, and let us know what you think because we're interested. We want to continue this. We want your suggestions. So we need topics. Give us topics. Yes. Have a good night. See you guys.